So it how does so someone complex. navigate this to like help guide their own clinicians? Cause you kind of have to, unfortunately. Let's yep. think about what your baseline is. Like, how were you starting at age 18 through your twenties, through maybe your early thirties in terms of sleep, cognition, mood, physical body, symptomatology, et cetera, right? Outside, outside of the normal process of aging and what that means, you know? And then is there a shift? You know, has there been a shift and are you of that age, right? Are you late forties, early fifties or in your forties? And now is your cognition different? Um, and, and it really is taking a look at like, what else is playing into this is, are your stress levels different? You know, what's different about your life? What's not supportive? What is protective? And, and you've got to trust yourself, right? If you feel like this is like a significant shift and this does not feel like the me I've known for 20 years, then it's worthwhile to fight for that and try and understand mm. what that is and fix it. And, and I think you're right. So like, let's go over the symptoms again. Obviously we always hear about hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms, but let's talk about all the other things. So feeling increased levels of stress, which can be anxiety, increased anxiety, in, uh, worsening mood or irritability or feeling depressed, sexual health changes. So vaginal dryness, decreased libido um, are common ones. Um, and then there's lots of other symptoms, headaches, nausea, acid reflux, um, hair and skin changes, usually dryness, um, frozen shoulder is one that I've understood that happens to a lot of people. Um, the musculoskeletal syndrome, of everyone is just aching, joints aching, pain, you know, so if, and, and again, if you've gone to your doctor for a checkup and there's nothing else wrong, it's probably perimenopause or menopause. So I would say at that point, my advice is to engage with the provider who has experience with and is willing to prescribe HRT. It doesn't mean you need HRT, but you have the possibility of having an evaluation with someone who's comfortable with it. And unfortunately, that's not every OBGYN. It's not every family medicine doc. It's not every internist. However, it really is important to find that person if you're starting to have this surge of symptoms. And if you have any of the mental health symptoms, including increased stress, anxiety, depression, changes in sleep, then think about engaging when, with a mental health provider or at least a primary care provider who can help guide you where to go. Let's talk about the two hormones, um, estrogen. We know that the estrogen decline is responsible for a lot of the symptoms of the menopausal transition. And the interesting thing is when I dug into the literature and the science of it, although this is not something I learned in medical school or my residency training in psychiatry, is that estrogen is involved in the metabolism of the neurotransmitters that are responsible and related to mood. So for example, serotonin, norepinephrine, even dopamine. Estrogen also exerts a complex influence on sleep and the sleep-wake cycles. So if your estrogen is fluctuating and it is responsible for those relationships, then your mood is going to fluctuate, meaning decrease or not feel so good. Um, and also your sleep is going to change, that there's a lot of sleep issues. Now, the other piece is the progesterone. So progesterone is actually an anxiolytic, so anti-anxiety hormone um, and a sedative. So uh, it works on the GABA pathway. And that's the same pathway that alcohol or the benzodiazepine medications like Xanax, Valium that we might be familiar with uh, work on. And so if your estrogen is depleting, then you may be likely to have more anxiety or not be as um, sedated in a good way as usual. Um, so, so there is an interaction between those hormone levels that are fluctuating and dropping and mood, anxiety, and sleep. So we know that the, the thing is though, we need more research to understand it. And I think we're just starting to get more funding and more advocacy in terms of more research. Me as a psychiatrist, what I do and, and how we're trained is we think of certain vulnerable groups, vulnerabilities, or people in certain stages of their life having specific risks associated to their health yeah. and mental health. So I know if someone is pregnant or postpartum, they have a specific risk profile. I also know now with time and education and understanding that if someone is in their third, late 30s, 40s, or let's say 50s, um, we got to think about the menopausal transition as a risk factor. So here's what we know. I, you know, I think if someone has a history of mental health issues, you have a history of anxiety, history of depression, history of ADHD, history of psychosis, trauma, et cetera, 
you're more vulnerable during this menopausal transition. There was one study that I saw, the Penn Ovarian study, that shows the risk is many fold. If you've had a history of depression, you're, you're, I mean, very high likelihood that you will experience depression again in the menopausal transition. Okay. Um, and then the other side is if you've never had depression, anxiety, let's just take those two, you're at twice to four times the risk uh, during the menopausal transition. What? Yes. And there's the, the recent CNN headline was that, you know, there's an increased risk of 40% for mental health conditions um, in perimenopause compared to before. Um, so the risk of depression is pretty high in perimenopause and the menopausal transition. If you've had it, it's very high. And if you haven't had it, it's pretty high. So I think if we just look at that and start there, for me as a public health person, that just speaks to education as key. We need to educate and prepare people for this yeah. phase of life. And I think like knowledge is power. If you know that this is this could happen, then you're not gonna be so confused or disoriented if it does happen and you can be prepared that it's coming. And I think that can really sort of set the stage for getting the right help and care in place. Just needs to know that it's not like a, a one-shot deal. You know, it probably is okay. something you might have to go back to your provider who's prescribing the HRT, tweak it a bit, and really give constant feedback so that you feel good. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll know when you do, don't feel good, whether it's your symptoms because of hormone fluctuation or whether it's side effects of the medications. And that's really a personal discussion with your healthcare provider. Okay. And in my case, she wanted me to wait three months. Um, so I have my annual visit coming up this summer. And so we'll discuss the dosing then. Um, I'm going to have lots of questions for her on progesterone because I'm on the lowest for the estrogen patch, but only on 100 for progesterone. And one of the experts I've spoken to, she's like, therapeutic dose of progesterone is 300 milligrams, not 100. It's almost like you're not taking it. So I've heard of yeah. different things. I've heard 200. I know. I've, so I think the thing is we're still learning. I don't think, I know. you know, I know there are some standards and, and prescribing practices by provider as well, but I think we're still learning. We need more yeah, studies. No.